Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for waving. I got one wave out of everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Haas. Welcome to Haas. Welcome back to Anderson. We have such an amazing lineup of alums for you today. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about the protocol for the afternoon, and then we're going to get to our first speaker. My name is Kelly McElhaney. I have been here at Haas for 20 years, which is really... I actually used to look at people who had been at Haas for 20 years and think, what a loser, can they not find another job and move around? And That's me. I've been with Haas X since its inception, which I did not realize until this week was 10 years. So I've spent half of my Haas years with Haas X, which is a phenomenal, better version of TED. This is Haas's version of TED. It's the mastermind of Tenny Frost, so big hand of applause for uh, Tenny. I came to Haas and started what is now the Center for Responsible Business back in 2002. I moved on from that when it was rated number, number one in the world. My dad always told me two things, academicians never leave, don't be one of those. And it's always good to leave when you're on top. So it has now been run by multiple other people and is doing fantastic work. My current center that I founded in 2017 is the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership. If you speak French, like our board chair, Larissa Rush, who is a Haas alum, she refers to us as EGAL, which is such a beautiful way to say it, but I say EGAL because I'm American. Um, the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership is igniting a movement of equity-fluent leaders who are out there really doing two things, igniting but mostly accelerating change because there is probably not one single human in this room that thinks we're changing too fast towards an equitable world. So accelerate is one of our favorite verbs, and we really do try to look at how can we create change faster. I'm, I teach courses in the area of equity fluent leadership here at Haas and all of the degree programs. I do a significant amount of corporate consulting in this space and executive education. My first trip, uh, not for a funeral, unfortunately, but post-COVID, well, I shouldn't say that, we're not post-COVID. My first big trip since we were all locked down was to Saudi Arabia about a month ago, where I teach historically a women's leadership program, but this year was the first year that we had emerging leaders, men and women in the room, to talk about inclusive leadership. So change is happening, just not fast enough. And the last thing I'll tell you um, that I'm doing right now, because I'm so passionate about it, just a little bit sad that Tenny scheduled today at the same time as the spring football game, but I do a lot of work with Cal Athletics, and if any of you are sports fans like I am, about 18 months ago, some legislation passed called Name Image Likeness, whereby now student athletes can monetize their own name image likeness as opposed to the university monetizing their name image and likeness. So as I was serving on that committee and watching it all unfold, and it has not all unfolded, if, if you want to know the dirty behind the scenes, we're building the plane, fixing the plane, landing the plane, flying the plane, and trying to save the plane at the same time with NIL. It's a really crazy world. But as I was listening to it all unfold, I did something you should never do at a public institution like Cal. I voiced an idea, and the next thing you know, they said, go do it. You have no money, <laughs> no staff. Um, but I designed a new course. I thought it just felt like an amazing opportunity for student athletes to intentionally build their brand. I absolutely think they should make a lot of money, but I wanted them to be intentional about what are their core values, what are their identity groups from which they come. So day one in my class, I, had, I said, how many of you in here would love to partner with Tesla? All the hands went up. How many of you know Tesla was the last company in the Fortune 500 to name a woman on their board. Few hands went down. How many of you know that Tesla does not have people of color, a person of color on their board? Few hands went down. How many of you know that Tesla is now um, in a legal situation because a white man threw a tire iron at a black woman on the shop floor? So that's my job, is to basically tell my students there is no Santa Claus <laughs> and to uh, <laughs> burst their bubble. But it ended up just, we just finished this past week. It was such a phenomenal class. It is not closed to student athletes because the NCAA, that is a violation. So I had about 45 student athletes 
and five non-student athletes, which is a weird thing to say. And it has been so wonderful to see the equity fluency that, that they are going to now go out there and intentionally build their brand on. But today is not about that. Today is about a phenomenal lineup. It's our 10th annual, as I said, Haas X. Um, we have six alumni presentations. It's gonna be very fast-paced, high on inspiration, high on energy. I will also tell you, having, having, met, having met all of these folks there, it's going to be high on empathy. It's gonna be high on vulnerability. And please keep in mind that for many of these folks, we've been back in person, but many folks who are gonna get up here and speak haven't been back live. So they have their big boy and girl pants on, no stretchy pants, no sweats, they have real shoes on, and they're here in public. So that, that adds an extra layer. Some of their stories, you won't even know if you were in class with them because they haven't told their story. So without further ado, oh, a Tenny would kill me if I didn't say this. Hashtag Haas alumni. Do the social media thing. Do it a lot. Shout out. And no Q&A. The Q&A will be out in the courtyard with drinks. It's a much better way to handle Q&A, if you ask me. First speaker is a former student of mine, now a friend, just a really special human being. His name is Olasheni Akintolabello. He's the lead counsel for product, pay product payments at Meta. He's also the co-founder of his own company car called Carpe Med. He's a Haas MBA class of 2021. Olasheni grew up in Nigeria, and he dreamed of a life in America through the characters he watched in films, which scares me not just a little. He never imagined he would live some of those plot lines as his search to make an impact in the world took him to over 55 countries, from Afghanistan to Australia, to the New York trading floor, which is a country in and of itself, I'm sure, to big tech. He's an army jag with a 10-1 win-loss record. Um, that was a path that was inspired by a few good men. And it all began when he arrived on our shores as an unaccompanied minor. So Olashini, the title of his talk is Failure Intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. It's the winter of 2008. I'm walking down the Avenue of the Americas in New York, looking up at the skyline, which is framed by the titans of industry, law, finance, entertainment, consulting. In my right hand, I'm holding my resume. And with each step, I feel like my life might just change. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I walk through a set of very familiar doors, and as I approach the counter, I give my resume to the lady at the counter. And she looks down at my resume, then looks up at me and says, but why? You're a lawyer. And my response is, yes, I am. And she says, but this makes no sense. I had just applied at a job at Starbucks. Not a corporate job, but to be a barrister. The night before, I'm wearing most of the warm clothes that I have. I have my rugby socks as the outer layer of the fence, pulling it up as high as I can. And I'm eating popcorn for dinner. This was the reality of that financial crisis. And at that moment when I applied to a job at Starbucks, yes, I felt like a failure. I felt like the dream as an immigrant had just been crushed. But I knew perhaps there was an opportunity there. Fast forward to five and a half years from that very day, I'm now a two minute walk from that same Starbucks. And I'm now on the trading floor at one of the world's largest investment banks. Seemingly my life is amazing. And, but deep down inside, there's a disconnect. Somehow my mission and passions aren't aligned. So I reach out to a managing director who had posted a job. The job was about social impact and access to capital. I'm thinking, that's something that I can get around. I'll feel like I have an impact. So I go to meet her, and of course I'm ready for an interview, and she says, Olusheni, I can't teach you what you need to know to do this job on the job. You need an MBA. 
I know that you're a lawyer. I know you're a combat veteran. I know you're driven. But I can't teach you this stuff. He says, you need to go get an MBA. So I'm taking notes, MBA. And <laughs> I'm about to close the notebook up. And she says, and by the way, it needs to be top 10 or don't even try. I'm like, OK. <laughs> and so I don't leave with a job. I leave with a homework assignment to go figure out exactly what I need to do to get into a top 10 MBA. Um, start Googling, start researching. I become pretty intimidated by those results. Um, so late nights, I start this process. After the trading floor, I'm studying. I'm opening up the GMAT book, which looks like hieroglyphics to me. And I'm just shooting my shot. I speak to my manager. My manager says, I'll support you on this, this new chapter. I mean, you came into Morgan Stanley. You're driven. Like, we'll, we'll, I'll support you. I start studying. There was one condition, though. I was going to apply for an executive MBA program, which meant that I was going to need a sponsorship letter. Sponsorship letter means your employer has to say, we will afford you the time to do this job um, while you work full time. And you need that letter. My manager was like, you get into a top MBA, we'll, we'll figure that part out, no problem. It happens, you get into a top school in New York. And when it's time to get the sponsorship letter to close out the application, it goes up to senior management and they say, we don't have precedent for sending lawyers to get MBAs. Why would we do that? Why, why, why would we let them go? And so without the sponsorship letter, I lost my offer. I come back the next day and I resign on the spot. I'm crushed because of how hard it was for me to do this. I was an English major. I took one math class in college, right? So the GMAT was like my worst demon. And what I had to do next was start all over. And what I learned was that moment I told you about earlier and multiple other failures, when we talk about failure intelligence, there's so much you can learn about yourself and about your journey. But the only way I was able to start all over again and now apply to full-time MBA programs where the decision makers were just myself and the admissions committee was because I've been here before when it felt like everything was gone. So much of our lives are polished and scripted. We look at resumes and we say, this person's amazing. We don't talk about the gaps. We don't talk about the failures because we want to hide them. But there's so much that we learn from those failures. And failure intelligence is a bit of a double entendre, right? There are the things we perceive to be failures. And there are also the failures in society, lack of inclusion, bias. All these other hurdles that come your way. Either way, you have to find a way to evolve and respond to them. And so I look across my career and the decisions I've made, and part of my takeaway has been to be like a Swiss Army knife. You pull out one tool, that doesn't work. You reach for the other and the other. What programs like these are doing is providing you a variety of toolkits that you can use in the future, but also the failures. Did you know that a toddler learning how to walk falls almost 70,000 times before they learn how to walk? That tells you that failure is priced into our existence. That is part of our evolution. So when you fail, when you fall, this is part of the process. I could assume that there's someone here who's challenged by their identity, by the job they have, by the mission in front of them, and those challenges in between those challenges, those failures, those things you perceive as failures, is where the learnings are. That's where the tools are. So lean into that. And the next time you find yourself at something that feels existential, listen to what you may learn. Listen to what may be in your mind. And hang on. Stay tuned for your next episode, your next chapter, because you're evolving. Thank you. I told you he was going to be great. If you had Olashani in class or as a classmate, a thousand words would come to your mind, but failure would not be one of those. So the fact that our opening speaker got up here and talked about his failure just goes to show the confidence without attitude that I think is the hallmark of Haas. 
When he talks about toddlers falling, you have to imagine that Ola Shaney has the most beautiful toddler in the world, Victoria. So I can't imagine this, what she's going to be at Haas soon. She'll probably be the youngest person to get in at Haas. But utilizing those tools, resetting precedents, bringing out that Swiss Army knife are all things that Ola Shaney, if you, anybody who knows him, just knows that he is a master of so many trades and constantly keeps surprising you with things he's done that we don't even know he's done yet. He has so much success. Our second speaker is Susie Schoenberg. She is the founder and head of Flexport.org. The title of her talk is Unconventional Definition of Success. She is a graduate of the full-time MBA class from 2017. She grew up in a country that no longer exists. From this, Susie learned how to transform the lack of boundaries into something that is so beautiful, the power of no limits. Susie. Hi everyone, I'm really, really excited to take you on my journey in the next five to eight minutes. So let's all imagine Susie, 18 years old, and I'm entering a beautiful castle near Cologne. I've never seen something like this. All the tall walls, but a yellow, and the sun is coming through those big majestic windows and is illuminating this beautiful, strong, elegant oak floor. And I make my way to my assigned seat. And I see everyone is talking already. And I wonder, did they know each other beforehand? Did I already miss something? And the people at my table, they're talking about the favorite journalists and newspapers. Because the next day, we will all be interviewed for college scholarships. And I make a mental note to myself, because in my family, we don't have new subscriptions. So there is another item I need to research tonight if I want to make it tomorrow. And so I look at them and they're all so comfortable in their formal clothes. And here I am, I'm wearing this suit for the first time. And I don't even know if it really sits right. So now I'm really glad that food is coming. Finally, it's perfect timing, I'm really hungry. So let's see what we got. Oh no, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> How should I even eat this? You know, what is this mystery item? By the way, it was an artichoke for everyone who is wondering. <laughs> and don't be afraid if you have never seen one, you know, you can figure it out. But in that moment, I was in shock. I was like, what should I do now? You know, they, they, who can I observe? And I did not only feel so uncomfortable, but there was like a sharp sting that made me aware, like painfully aware, that I did not belong there. You know, because all the other ones apparently knew what to do, and they also knew what vegetables they were eating. And so the reason why I did not know what to eat, what to say, what to wear, how to start a conversation, is because I grew up in a country that does not exist anymore, East Germany. And so all the food that I knew and that my parents were used to was mostly grown on fields nearby. There were no imports of you know, fruit and vegetables like Gadi Shogs. There weren't multiple brands. In fact, there was no free media. And education, there was something that people were not even allowed to strive for. And so when East Germany collapsed and ceased to exist, the whole context you know, that made up my whole world just like turned into a void. And since then, I've been feeling like an outsider, like an outsider who doesn't know enough. Many years later, um, I still made it you know, a lot of hard work, and I ended up at Haas. And actually, I was sitting in this very room and so excited to be here. You know, it was like the third week of the program, and I was to hear from a real founder, you know, like someone who started kind of his own company. And I and thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. And so after the talk, I just went up to him and I was like, hi, I'm Susie, you're awesome, can I work for you? <laughs> and there was just, you know, silence. <laughs> He looked, and I was like, maybe, you know, maybe accent, you know? But, um, so you look really confused. 
really surprised. I think he did understand me. And you know, this feeling came back. You know, this feeling of not belonging. I realized, you know, my cheeks are just like start to glow again. And a few days later, I would also learn what happened. I remember how at a meeting for, you know, how to network, the career advisor said, you know, there's only one thing you need to remember today. Never, like, never ask for a job directly in your first meeting. And I was like, okay, <laughs> there it is. Now, now I know what I did. And I was really fortunate, and so my unintended boldness, I'd wish I would be so bold, paid off. Um, the founders so invited me for a coffee shed, and I started to work at this company while earning my degree. And what I learned in just like at this experience and from working at the startup was that there are other spaces that kind of operate in a void where you can build and you can create. And by not knowing what's actually possible, I also did not know what was impossible. And so I just went for it. And my outside perspective allowed me to be really creative and to, to drive the change. It also allowed me to pursue my lifelong passion to, to enable people's full potential. And after my time at Haas, I leveraged the experiences that I had during high school when I was a volunteer for traumatized children and worked with them and my own experiences and the desire to reach more people to found my own organization. And I went on and founded Flexpo.org, an organization that uses logistics for social and environmental impact. And with an amazing group of people, we delivered humanitarian aid to over 100 million people already. If you want to know how to get stuff into Ukraine right now or how to decarbonize in an industry where emissions are rising, find me. You know, we can talk about it. I knew some things now. Uh, which is great, and I would love to share. In general, what I learned thro throughout all these experiences is that I don't need to belong to anyone's world. I have all the tools I needed, and I was also and will be able to learn everything I need to know to create my own path, and I hope that everyone can feel the same. I think that's the reason why I'm back in this very room to share my story, um, so that, you know, when I encounter a new situation today where I don't know what is being talked about, where something feels new, I'm not uncomfortable anymore. I embrace the situation to start a conversation, to push the limits, and to also create programs to scale my social and environmental impact. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Thank you, Susie. So fitting right now in today's world to hear themes of being an outsider, of not fitting in, of wondering if you belong. And I, you, I just love the two role models we've already heard from who both did come from outside of this country. And what I know of both of them is not only did they carve their own path, but they also make sure that people around them feel like they belong. I love your line. By not knowing what was possible, you don't know what was impossible. Uh, you, heard you heard two speakers who talked about social impact, confidence with without attitude, it's just personifications of who we say we are as Haas. This proves to you that this is who we are. Speaker number three, Jesse Perwal, full-time MBA of 2007, uh, social, uh, social, senior, you are social, very social, very. senior vice president. <laughs> head of brand at Qualtrics. His talk today is personifying purpose. Jesse has had a fun and enriching career, career building purpose-based brands, but it was only by reflecting on stories from his past that he learned to articulate his own purpose. He has a story to share with you all today about reflecting on a lifetime of clues and how that can help you unlock your why. Jesse. Thank you. Well, I hope, it's, I hope it's only been around a half a lifetime at this point, but <laughs> I'm praising for the best. I actually want to dedicate today's talk to the memory of Bill Sonnenschein, who taught so many of us in this room to find our voices, taught me to find mine. Um, when I was 15, I was at the peak of my career. 
<laughs> as an athlete. I had just gotten drafted by uh, a pretty good hockey team that was in a well-recognized league near where I grew up. And even though I had been the captain of pretty much every hockey team I'd played on up until that point, this team already had a captain. As a matter of fact, the captain of this team happened to be the son of the coach. And so my odds looked slim to take that title. I, I tried to do it anyway. I kind of went in there and was a little bit aggressive, played a little harder, threw a little more elbows, you know, talked some more. I was doing a whole bunch of stuff that didn't feel really authentic to me. Um, and at the same time, what I was feeling was a really warm energy from Rob, from the guy who was the captain. His name was Rob Petrus. And as my relationship with Rob developed, and as our team did really well, which was the whole reason we wanted to get me and the team together, some interesting things started to happen. Rob opened up and shared some vulnerabilities and some perspectives with me. It turned out having a dad as a coach standing behind you during games and on the ice with you, you know, on the ice with you during practice made it so that you didn't always bring your full self to the table. And moreover, he was worried about was he going to play well enough for the next couple of years to make it into college and play there. And so being kind of a, a backboard for Rob and some of his challenges and being a thought partner for him on how to resolve some of it, as well as just having a ton of fun playing with him, was a great source of fun and, and inspiration for me. And showing up to help Rob become a better leader actually turned out to be my highest and best use as a teammate. The last game of that year happened to be the state championship in Michigan for our age group, and we won the game on a goal that Rob scored. And as we skated the trophy around center ice at Joe Louis Arena in downtown Detroit, we crossed the finish line together, and it was incredible to have gone on this journey growing myself, helping another leader become a little bit better. Fast forward a few years, and I'm a freshman at Northwestern in, in Evanston, and it's getting towards the end of the year and setting up for dorm elections for who's going to be running the dorm student government next year. Now, my, my dorm my freshman year was a residential college, which is a, a kind of important place, if you don't know. We had a charter, we had a budget, we had a theme, and we, we did important stuff, trust me, really important stuff. And so we had a president. There was going to be a president and a vice president. And if you lived in my dorm, you knew that Josh Gershenson was going to be the president. Josh was this unbelievable alchemy of inspiring, uh, intellectually astute, and just passionate about procedure. I mean, if anybody was going to be a dorm president, it was Josh. And I felt a calling to do something where I would support Josh and try to be the, the veep for Josh. He, he struggled with some of the things that you needed to do to succeed in the role. He, he had a hard time relating to some of the faculty and the staff and the grad students that we needed on our side to do the work we needed to get done. And, even though he was really empathetic, he had a hard time kind of listening for long enough to hear people's problems out. And so finding a, a niche there to coach Josh, work with him, and help him become a better leader was where I felt called and where I felt magnetized. And we didn't change the world, but we changed our little corner of Evanston, and we did some really great stuff. That summer, I uh, picked up a copy of Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, on a, f a flight from Sacramento to Seattle with Enya on my disc man blaring in my ears. <laughs> yeah, as Kelly said, I'd be vulnerable. And <laughs> as I read the book, you know, the habits were great, you know, PPC balance, I can probably tell you most of the stuff in there. And as a recovering consultant, I loved the frameworks. But what stood with me the most wasn't any of that. It was actually the orthogonal reflection there that Dr. Covey was actually scaling himself by acting as a coach to other leaders. I was like, you can do that as a job? Turns out it's called consulting. It's a pretty well-heeled path, but I didn't know that at the time. So I thought I want to follow that in my career. 15 years later, after having done consulting at some big firms, some smaller firms, as I reflected on what brought me the greatest joy and where I'd had the greatest impact, it, it wasn't the brand we put into the world or the experience we designed. It was actually the the way that I got to influence the career arc of somebody who had a goal, somebody who set out to do something and called on me and a team to go do it. Being a brand person at some point, I decided it was the right thing to do to crystallize my own purpose. Probably having kids had something to do with that. And so I 
I thought about, well, where had I had the most impact? Where had I had the most fun? And where had I learned the most? And as I thought about those three dimensions, I kept coming back to, to Rob Petras, to Josh Gershenson, to all of the clients and colleagues that I'd had a, a hand in maybe helping them do something in their career. And when I got through the exercise, it was, turns out, something pretty simple, helping leaders lead. It's just three words. It's probably fairly replicatable by a lot of people and certainly pretty darn simple, but that's the beauty of it, is it didn't have to be complex. And it doesn't have to be a leader on a stage. It, it can be somebody in the public eye, like my current boss, our chief marketing officer at Qualtrics, or it can be my two children who intend to create great change in the world. If you're somebody who has the desire and the ambition to go make a mark on the world, helping leaders lead. So with that as, as a reflection, what I'd ask is, since we find ourselves in this moment where many of us are discovering a newfound agency and how we think about the future of not just our work, but our life and the role that it plays professionally and personally, everything coming together, it's a great time to, to reflect on and think about why, why we're here, not just the ambition we have, but the reason we have for it and what drives us. And so I'd, I'd, I'd ask you just a couple things. Number one, and this is a complete thief and doctor from someone sitting in this room, and he, he knows who he is. Get out an actual piece of paper and do some reflecting and write down what you think your purpose is, just the thoughts that occur to you. Think about those, those vectors of where you've been happiest, where you've had the most impact, where you've learned the most, and just write down what comes to you. And number two, think about your life as a series of clues, a series of clues. It wasn't like I sat down, oh, Josh, Rob, consult it. My Here it is. My purpose is on my web. I, I went to Squarespace, bought a website, wrote it down. It's real. You can check it out. But I, it took some time to go through those clues, and it took the writing to get through it. And it took bringing it to other people and saying, what do you think? At Haas, um, I think it, yeah. We talk about being students always. I would encourage everybody here in, in this moment and forever to, to always be a student of yourself. Thank you. So many things I could reveal about Jesse, but I'm really trying hard to not. I did not know, Jesse, you're a hockey star. Somehow that does surprise me, but that was fantastic. He peaked at 15, it's not true. Um, I do hope you replace Disc Man in the future with Disc Person. <laughs> Jesse, smash the patriarchy. Um, their courageous vulnerability on display today is so refreshing and it's not going to stop. Our fourth speaker today is Leisha Bell. She is an alum from a program that no longer exists but has morphed into a different program, Berkeley Columbia Executive MBA program. She's the co-founder of BLX VC. Uh, she's the Economic F Opportunity Fund Manager of PayPal Ventures. And the title of her talk today, it's such a wonderful title, Making Change with Cartwheels. Lisa, Lisa is a change maker, in fact. She's been making change since she worked as a kid at the gas station owned by her dad and her uncle. Her family's business and community were upended by the L.A. riots. We're at the 30-year anniversary of the LA riots. This lived experience of Alicia's gave early shape to her vision of where race, class, and opportunity intersect and her role redressing the imbalance and inequity. Where it used to be nickels and dimes for Alicia, it is now tens of millions of dollars. She's still making change and moving capital to where it is needed most. Alicia. Can I get $10 on pump number seven? Okay. Can I get a pack of cools? You want 100 or light? Okay. Uh, can I get some condoms? Bareback or Trojans? <laughs> These were my regular demands as a seven-year-old cashier at my dad's gas station, affectionately called Bell Shell, located on the corner of Western and Florence 
in South Central Los Angeles. It was 1987. Every Saturday, I showed up for duty, swiping credit cards, counting pennies, cleaning bathrooms in my lovely booth that smelled of Lysol, menthol, and petroleum. The gas station, to me, was the epicenter of family and community and represented the best of black Los Angeles. A few years later, things would change. I'm now 12 years old. It's 1992. I've watched over and over and over again a man, his name was Rodney King, beaten by five Los Angeles police officers. It was the first amateur video that was recorded and exposed for all of us to watch. And today, they were going to read the verdict. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. No one was guilty of a crime we all watched. Could not believe my eyes. My dad called and said he wouldn't be coming home. He had to stay at the station. He hung a black-owned sign in the cashier's window, and we prayed. It was six relentless days of fires, burning, looting, shooting. It was much more than about Rodney King. Just a few moments prior, a young girl, her name was Latasha Harlan, she walked into a liquor store to buy orange juice. The owner thought she was stealing. He shot her in the back of the head. She died instantly. And the only penalty she got, he got was community service hours. The community was angry. They were upset. They had a right to be. My dad stayed because while everybody was shutting down, he knew he had to stay open to provide gas and utility to community that needed it. He stood in for his Asian neighboring businesses so that the people wouldn't loot them, so they could stay open. He stood in and activated. Even though the gas station remained unharmed, the aftermath of the riot was crucial. The franchise divested from black communities, closed its doors, and like that, we lost everything. Today marks the 30th anniversary of the Los Angeles riots, my first racial awakening that would be the foundation of who I would become in future years. It's now 2020, April. I get a phone call from a colleague. Girl, you're not going to believe this. What, what, he did what? I go to my social media feed. I see my CEO makes a post on Instagram, but looks like he's doing a cartwheel, and the caption reads, I know times are hard, but I found my joy. <sighs> now, if this was a regular day, I would have just let it gone by. But it wasn't. It was the midst of COVID was still new and uncertain. And then we're in the midst of civic and social unrest because another unarmed black man had been killed named George Floyd, along with Breonna Taylor and too many countless others. In my feed, I see a white feed and a black feed. I call this white joy in the midst of black rage. The white feed has playing with animals at the park, barbecue at the beaches. The black feed is full of anger, sorrow, and rage. This is the dichotomy of the two realities that I am watching unfold. This time, I am no longer a helpless 12-year-old girl watching TV. I am ready to activate. I am equipped. I am tooled, because I have not only one, but two MBAs. Thank you, Berkeley Columbia program. <laughs> so I knew I had to mobilize. So I got a team together, negotiated, advocated, and after a few weeks, I was so proud of the most corporate historic action that happened because of internal activation. My company, PayPal, announced a $535 million commitment to black lives and racial equity. <laughs> and
And today, I'm proud this is my full day job at PayPal Ventures, where I manage the Economic Opportunity Fund for emerging black and brown leaders who are building funds and are investing in community, the thing that is so core to me. So you see, when I saw that cartwheel, it wasn't just a cartwheel. It was the privilege of having a childlike innocence. It was a privilege that I didn't have, and especially Latasha Harlan's did not have, and so many kids in community who don't get that same privilege. The cartwheel represented the freedom to have joy. And today, it is my heart's desire that my daughter will be able to do cartwheels every day without reprieve. Thank you. Welcome to my world of having to follow brilliant students. <laughs> really hard act to follow. Leisha, thank you so much. I was just sitting there as a parent imagining how incredibly proud your dad is of you and all you've done today. I really like, and I'm going to fully cite you, the internal activator language. And what are we doing today to post what you call white joy? in the midst of black rage, or what are we doing to amplify the black experience along with joy? Two MBAs, sorry, she got you guys, that's the hard one, to... <laughs> it's really hard. Um, our fifth speaker today, Eric Meyerson, he's a full-time MBA graduate of, uh, from 2002. 2002. Uh, he's the VP of Marketing for Turntide Technologies. The talk he's going to give today is called Are We the Baddies? A Better Career for a Better World. Before transitioning to a career today in environmental sustainability, he worked for some blue chip companies that he found very exciting, some that made him uncomfortable, and some that were both. Eric. Thank you. That was a really hard act to follow. Can I pass? <laughs> um, it's so great to see everybody's faces here today. Um, I am reminded of when I first got into business school and uh, I came here and I went and I got dinner with somebody in the area and they said, so what brought you to the Bay Area? And I said, I'm going to business school. And they said, you? And I said, it's Berkeley. It's the business school for people who can't believe they're going to business school. <laughs> So um, today I want to ask everybody a pretty serious question, kind of a hard question. And the question is, whom do you work for? Whom do you really work for? I'm not talking about your boss or your CEO or whoever hired you. I mean, if you're putting in 40, 50, 60 hours a week or more, you're creating value. To whom is that value accruing? Inside your company, outside your company, in the world? Do you know? Are you happy with the answer? In 2010, I joined Google. I was their first head of video advertiser marketing. That meant that my job was, among other things, transitioning the image of YouTube from a home for dogs on skateboards, I don't know how many of you remember this iPhone ad, but all of our advertisers did, to home of the world's most innovative, interesting, and influential content. Working at YouTube was a trip. It was challenging, and it was really rewarding. In 2012, I transitioned from the advertiser side of the house to the creator side of the house, which meant that my prime business objective went from earning revenue for the business to watch time, getting people to watch more YouTube. It sounds nefarious, but it's not. More YouTube meant we were doing a good job with our product, and people liked our content. But then there was a moment, a moment that I had never had on a job before. A couple coworkers and I were sitting in a conference room planning the year ahead. And one of us, I can't remember which one, asked the question, is this good? Is this good? In other words, is a world where people are watching a billion hours of YouTube a month a better world? Where's that time coming from? How does that change things? Suddenly, the weight of what we were doing really hit me. It reminded me of a comedy sketch that I really liked from a TV show called Michelin Webb. 
that aired in, uh, on the BBC in the mid-2000s. In this sketch, two officers on the battlefield um, in World War II look at their uniforms, and they see that they're covered in skulls and images of death. And they ask themselves a really difficult question. Are we the baddies? <laughs> now, I'm not comparing myself or YouTube or anyone to Nazis. I want to be really clear about that, OK? Um, but um, it was an opportunity for us to say, is this world that we're creating a better world? Um, and it wasn't always easy to answer that question. At YouTube, that was a very hard question to answer. Now, a couple years later, I interviewed at a mobile gaming startup. And I spent a few hours in the afternoon with their executives. And I heard nothing but contempt for their customers, contempt for their products. And I knew they were the baddies. <laughs> and I wasn't going to work with them. Um, instead, I took a job at another company in early 2016, one you might have heard of, Facebook. So uh, I was director of media marketing for Facebook. Um, I took the opportunity because it was an opportunity to build a peer to YouTube and to Netflix. Now, I admit I had somewhat ambivalence of the company in early 2016. On one hand, they had kind of a mixed reputation for privacy, data sharing, data collection. On the other hand, I use their products every day. I still do. I really like them. And when I got to campus and I met my coworkers, they were intelligent, motivated, kind. They were in it for the right reasons. So that alleviated some of my doubts. My first product I had to bring to market was core to Facebook's new video strategy, Facebook Live. With Facebook Live, you can, with a tap on your phone, broadcast yourself to your friends, your family, or the entire world. There were some really inspiring examples early on of this. People were launching a business baking cookies, showing their kids' school play to their family, those who couldn't see it. It was great. But soon, the dark side started to take over. We had our first carjacking, our first suicide, our first murder on Facebook Live. My job got really hard all of a sudden. It seemed that in developing this really powerful tool for the world, no one in the house really seemed to think about how it would get weaponized. Another product that I was marketing was news. Now, Facebook and the news industry have had a very difficult relationship over the years, to say the least, for a number of reasons, the first of which is economic. But also, it's because in the Facebook news feed, real journalism gets defeated over and over again by controversial, outrageous content. And what this meant is that scammers, foreign adversaries like Vladimir Putin, could figure out that they could manipulate people because a lot of gullible people have an unending appetite for stories about how their least favorite politicians are actually corrupt pedophiles. After Brexit, fake news, and the 2016 presidential election, I flew to Copenhagen for an event called News Exchange. It's one of the world's largest global news and journalism uh, expositions. And the theme that year was has Facebook destroyed journalism and democracy? Now, it wasn't anything I hadn't heard before, but I couldn't deny what was happening on the products that I was trying to drive adoption of. My personal morale took a real downward spiral, and so did my job performance. I was out of there in a few months. I spent time thinking about who I was really working for and who I wanted to work for. If I have another 15 years in the workforce, viably, who did I want the value of my work to accrue? So I decided that's when I was going to start my climate career. Because to me, climate crisis was the world's biggest problem and one of the hardest to solve and one of the most important to solve. I soon met the executive chairman of an early stage startup that made hyper-efficient electric motors. I have not spent a lot of time thinking about motors in my life. Um, but I soon learned, as I did my homework, that solving the climate crisis is about upgrading all of the world's commercial and industrial systems. Those are what produce most of the carbon emissions. So our company worked in built environment, agriculture, and transportation. I Decided I actually I was assigned to spend my first year working with our agriculture division as our VP of marketing. 
Here's me with one of my new coworkers. <laughs> She's great. Um, in addition to agriculture, um, we also focus, I mentioned, on the built environment and also electrifying commercial and industrial transportation. Now, if you're interested in sustainability, there's never been a better time to get into it. Investment is growing 300% a year. Bill Gates has said the next 10 Bill Gateses are gonna be climate tech CEOs. Why? Because it's not charity anymore. A business doesn't invest in sustainability just for PR or to make their family feel good. It has a positive ROI on it now. Energy is really expensive. And people wanna buy things from companies that are sustainable. So sustainability projects have an astronomical ROI. Some of them pay for themselves in months, not years. But it's not just sustainability. If there's anything that you're into, it is quite possible that over the last few years, technology and the world has changed in a way that there is a positive economic model behind that cause. And if you wanna explore that, you can work in that. You can put yourself to work in that. You can actually make change. And so, right now, when you think about whom you work for, think about whom you wanna work for. Who do you want to benefit? from your remaining hours of labor in the workforce for the rest of your career, no matter what you do. Now, imagine the world that you want to exist in a few decades, the world that your kids are growing up in, your grandkids are growing up, humanity lives in. What do you want that world to look like? What will that look like? The story of that world, how we got from right here, right now, to that world is being written. What character are you in that story? Are you one of the baddies? Or are you one of the heroes? Thank you, everybody. If you have not hashtag Haas alumni yet, Haas, the B-School of people who can't believe they're going to B-School. I think that is absolutely perfect. Um, Tenny would kill me if I talked politics, so I will. Um, today in the New York Times, I wake up and get my coffee and read the New York Times, and I don't know if you read it today, but there's, I hope it's not more than three parts, but there's a multi-part story of Tucker Carlson. And I guarantee you, Eric, that he has never once asked himself, is he a baddie? <laughs> so could you call him up? Um, I just really love, again, this, this theme of creating social positive impact with your life, with your purpose, with making intentional choices. Who do you work for and who you're going to be, as you talked about there. We have one more speaker. I think this just goes way too fast for my taste, but I'm really excited. Our sixth and final speaker today is Wendy Nguyen. She is an undergraduate from Haas 2002. She's currently the Senior Vice President of Marketing and, Gro Marketing and Growth, Section 4, co-founder of a, a new organization called Stand with Asian Americans, Let's Tell Asian Stories. Wendy is here to share her own story of growing up Asian in America and why she wrote a letter that then helped to spark a movement. Wendy. It's 3 a.m. and I get a tap on my shoulder. I'm 10 years old and it's my mom. I know I need to wake up, but waking up in the middle of a sleep cycle is real hard. So I give myself 30 seconds, 10, nine, eight. Okay, I'm up. I throw on my trusty yellow sweatshirt, a pair of sneakers, and I head out and it's pitch dark but it's always pitch dark. On Tuesdays are the best days. The newspapers are the lightest. Sundays are the worst days. There's two editions and all of the advertisers have crammed in inserts. It's raining, oh crap. That means I'm not gonna get home until 6.30, so I might as well grab a donut and roll right into school. That was my routine, 365 days a year, seven days a week, starting at the age of 10. And I did it for six years. You see, my parents left Vietnam 
in 1979, a few years after the fall of Saigon. They left their home, their family, their friends, and they got on a boat and they traveled to an Indonesian refugee camp. And a year later, we settled in San Jose. And a couple years later, my dad passed away. So it was just me, my mom, and my two older brothers trying to rebuild a life. But the one thing that that experience taught me was that if I work hard, I'll make it through. So I worked hard at work, and I worked hard at school, and I made it to Cal. And then when I got to Cal, I worked really hard, and I made it to Haas, and I graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a 3.7 GPA, technically 3.8 if you round up. <laughs> and then I made it into Bain. So it's my first week at Bain, and I feel on top of the world because I'm literally on top of the world. It's the 36th floor of Embarcadero One, and there are floor to ceiling views of the entire bay. You could see Coit Tower, there are sailboats out there on the water, and I just tried to make myself a cappuccino with the crazy machine in the lunchroom, unsuccessfully, and I head into the main conference room. And I'm sitting there and I'm having this heated debate with a colleague. And he turns to me and he says, you don't speak English good. And it was 20 years ago. And I remember it clearly because I felt humiliated. And instantly I knew that the rules of the game have changed. This isn't work, this isn't school, where you can work hard and get a good grade. This is work, where there's class and power and privilege, apparently the privilege to be an asshole at work without impunity. So it taught me another lesson. And I, I wish I could tell you it was my first story and my only story. But it was the first of a series of stories at every stage in my career. And it taught me another lesson, that sometimes working hard isn't enough. That there's discrimination and racism. And it's not in some far off place. It's probably in your workplace. It's one of the reasons why a few of us started Stand with Asian Americans, which is a coalition of Asian business leaders who are devoted to ending violence against the AAPI community and elevating all marginalized communities. Asian Americans are not okay. We are not okay on the streets, we're being spit on, assaulted, and killed at alarming rates. Hate crimes against Asians are up three to five X in places like San Francisco and New York over the past year. Asian American women are the least promoted of any gender racial group. And in a place like Facebook, where 54% of the employees are Asian, there is one person on the executive team who is half Asian. We started SWA for all of those reasons. It got started about a week after the Atlanta shootings, where eight innocent people died, six who looked like my mom. And in that one moment, the one thing I felt like I could do was take a vague idea in a Google Doc and turn it into a letter that expressed the frustration of a generation of Asian Americans who can no longer stay silent about what's happening to the community. And the irony is not lost on me that it was I who proposed that we print it in the front section of the Wall Street Journal. 
because apparently some people still read newspapers. <laughs> like our 43rd president, George W. Bush, who read the letter, went on our website, and signed it. SWA is about a year old now. We do this, it's 100% volunteer run. We do this in the evenings, on the weekends, between feeding kids and trying to get some sleep. And I do it because I don't think what's going on is fair. It violates what I think is great about America. And honestly, I don't want to see another Asian grandmother punched in the face. And I don't want my kids to have that same feeling I had my first week at Bain. So I'm going to leave you with one last story. You might know Kevin because his name's on this building. I know Kevin because we studied abroad together our junior year in Hong Kong, and he was my personal currency calculator. He was always very good at mental math, not so good at day trading. <laughs> and when it came time to like prepping for case interviews and investment banking interviews, he was my personal quiz on market sizing questions. So I made it into Bain, but Kevin didn't. They didn't see his talent. Then he went on to Deutsche Bank, and his VP didn't see his talent. So the question that I ask is, who bears the cost of Asian discrimination, or frankly, any discrimination? It's us. Because for every one Kevin or Wendy who is lucky enough to get a Cal education and live in San Francisco during the epicenter of the tech revolution, there's 99 other Kevin and Wendy's buried in some middle-wage career where people can't see their talent be they, because they don't have quote-unquote executive presence. So I'm going to end with my I work in advertising and in marketing, and I'm going to end with my favorite motto of all time. Let there be light. Thank you for letting me tell you my story. I appreciate it. There could be no more light. This is incredibly just awe-inspiring. Wendy, thanks for telling us and sharing with us your story. Again, I can just imagine uh, your father and mother and how proud they are and, and what you're doing today and you're amplifying. I mean, I, that Facebook, 54% Asian as a company, 1% on the executive team, one person who's half Asian, and that is just ridiculous. Uh, thanks to everyone here. Let me just give you some summary themes that I took away. I love how Olashani started out by talking about how in awe he was of the titans of Wall Street. I'm in awe of the titans of Haas, sitting right here. So huge round of applause, please, for all of these. I like the theme of unintended boldness, because I do believe that boldness is what the world needs a significant amount more of today. The themes of mission, passion, impact, fun, purpose, learning. Uh, I think we should all be the Swiss army knives of accelerating change. When I'm listening to Leisha talk about the Rodney King um, uprisings and what was happening and then thinking, wait, that was 30 years ago? And then Grand Rapids? Two, two weeks ago, I mean, we need to bring out our Swiss Army knives to accelerate change. I love the top, the, uh, the, by not knowing what's possible, you don't know what's impossible. Vulnerability is beautifully strong. I want to talk to you a little bit about my research, which looks at effective leadership today. I don't care about powerful leaders. I spent too many years in awe, or supposed to be in awe, of powerful leaders. Yet, when I did my own research and asked individuals to talk about the most powerful leader they ever worked for, I heard that they were afraid. 
I heard that they were really afraid of bringing up something new, something risky, something innov innovative. I heard that they checked parts of themselves at the door. So about 10 years ago, I started to change the question around admired leadership. And I asked my research participants to talk about the leader they most admired. And what I heard from an ROI perspective was, I designed an entire new product line because I knew that she had my back and that if I failed, it would be okay. I heard stories of 20 year, years ago, not of an asshole at work, but somebody who just shifted this person's career and life trajectory. And they tell a story as if it was just yesterday of how that leader made them feel. But the hallmarks in my research around admired leadership are a couple of things that you saw today. Vulnerability, uncomfortable, the ability to get uncomfortable and to stick, not race into your comfort zone. Courage, you heard courage just multiplied. Uh, curiosity, to be a chief learning officer, to not be a chief know-it-all. And accountability, how do you hold yourself accountable? Who do you work for? Are you a baddie? Can I step up and tell my story? Can I let down my pride and go work as a barista even though I was already a barrister? Is that the right word? Yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, just the themes here are incredible, and I want to end at least the themes here and then wrap up the whole event around what are you doing to be an internal activator? Leisha, I just really love that phrase. What are you doing in your organizations, in your neighborhoods, in your social media accounts to be an internal activator? Because what I hear today are six internal activators from Haas. Just another round of applause before I close it out for our speakers. Hashtag Haas alumni. Don't forget to put all of these this stories of wisdom, amplify these stories on social media. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to just recognize before I close out two people who are incredibly important today who don't get enough credit because they are behind the scenes. One is Tenny Frost. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> And the other is Francesca LeBaron, stand up. <laughs> um, Francesca is an MBA of 2019, former student and also now very close friend who is our storytelling coach. So has worked, works with countless people at Haas, but worked with our speakers today. So thank you very much for your help. Uh, just a few things in closing. What can you do after today? Besides all of the challenges that our speakers gave you, hire Haas. We love it when we, when Hossies hire Hossies, when those of you who have the ability to hire people, look at our students first, and you don't need to go anywhere else. Stay active and connected with your, your Haas network wherever you live. Um, our strength does come from one another. Our, our alumni association is only as strong as each of our individual alumni organizations. And then, of course, investing back in Haas. My center exists, the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, because of Haas investors. My board is mostly filled with Haas alum investors. So it's proof that, that, that it allows us to accelerate and ignite change. Thanks again for attending today. Um, we're going to go out into the courtyard. You can reconnect with one another, uh, meet the speakers, ask questions of our speakers, and enjoy refreshments. Thank you so very much for being here.